Tyler, I'm not sure if you've been caught up in any of the traffic snarls that have, uh, have been plaguing downtown Ottawa this week um, due to some picketing public servants, um, public services on uh, Lines of Canada, 155,000 members on strike. What are the impacts of that um, on Canadian ag? You know, it's, it's uh, I, I haven't personally been impacted yet, but it certainly got a lot of attention, this uh, largest uh, strike in, in recent Canadian history. Uh, certainly when you've got 150,000 civil servants that are striking, there's going to be some impacts on agriculture where government uh, is uh, involved in, in many different ways. A lot of the, kind of the primary uh, focus has been on grain inspectors who are uh, some of the ones that are out on the picket lines now. So the Canadian Grain Commission uh, inspects grain as it moves off of farms and, and to, to export position or to, to end users. And, and so some of those inspections have stopped and, and that impacts the value chain. Um, we've got some, some concern about uh, potential processing. This is a time of year when the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada has got programs that are open that farmers and others are applying for. Uh, we have to wait and see whether or not they're going to have to start to change some of those deadlines to give more flexibility for people applying. Uh, uh, again, you know, when you've got that many federal civil servants that are striking, there's there's uh, ultimately going to be some some impacts, but I think it really will depend on how long this goes on. And is that the case where the longer this goes, the worse the impacts become, as it as it is in so many other areas? Yeah, it it um, again, it is some of the strikes like the the green inspection issue that is an issue um, right away but you know we, we do need the government to work um, for some people in agriculture it's it's not as bad as it could be because the Canadian Food Inspection Agency isn't impacted by the strike yet at this point in time so um, kind of the inspectors that are responsible for keeping that part of the food system going are still working they're still doing their work um, but uh, clearly if it if it drags on the consequences will be more important again it it uh, is, a, is an interesting example opportunity for people to see, people in, in the industry to see what role Agriculture Canada and its staff really do play and to understand the consequences of, you know, uh, those, those civil servants not, not showing up to work. Hmm. We, um, we had some work news at uh, Loblaw this week. Um, President Galen Weston giving up that part of his title. Uh, and there's a new Dane in town. What do we know about the new president or incoming president at Loblaws? Well, you know, I think uh, one thing that we know is that while there's, um, I think, a lot of coincidence, you know, this is being announced, uh, this change is being announced, um, you know, weeks after uh, there was quite a public backlash to uh, increases in Galen Weston's compensation, um, a little over a month after Galen Weston was in front of the Agriculture Committee talking about food price inflation. but you know, this isn't something that that was pulled together, pulled together in a matter of weeks in reaction to this. This is a search that started at the end of last summer. This is part of a kind of a bigger uh, management change, uh, looking at taking, you know, Galen Weston, who wore many hats, wears many hats in, inside the Loblaws and Weston uh, empire and, and taking one of those hats off and, and handing it to someone that comes to Canada with uh, decades of experience in the Danish retail sector a real uh, leader there. Um, and so, you know, I think I think that the timing certainly makes this look suspicious, but it's probably not as suspicious as people make it out to be. And the person we're talking about is someone by the name of Per Bank. What do we know about how Per Bank has, has run the Danish companies um, that, that he's helmed? You know, I, I, again, I think, I think when you look at, um, Kind of the uh, read the news from Europe. He seems to be pretty well, um, um, pretty well respected. He's been in a senior leadership position in um, uh, a retail giant in Denmark for more than a decade. Really brings um, quite a bit of experience uh, in a retailer uh, driving growth, um, and and um, again brings. You know, I, I think every retail sector is different. The, the pressures are unique in Canada as they are uh, other places. Uh, but something that we have seen is our food retailers, uh, you know, increasingly going outside of the sector. Uh, Empire, uh, that on Sobeys went uh, to Canadian Tire uh, outside of food in order to get a senior executive. Uh, to its its uh, current CEO 
Um, again, law of law is going outside of Canada, but sicking in food retail to get its uh, CEO. But I think that it is one of the dynamic, you know, where we have a relatively small number of retailers, large retailers in Canada. So when they go looking for, for a search, if they want somebody that has that kind of that leadership experience, um, then they've got to look outside of the country. We've seen and we've talked about this before, right? Global, global supply chains and the effects of those um, on Canadian grocers. Um, do you think this gives Loblaw a bit of a leg up that it didn't have previously to have someone who's been, um, you know, leading in a European firm uh, for, for more than a decade, as you say? You know, I think I think Loblaw uh, doesn't need much of a, a leg up. Uh, if you look at, at kind of the, the strategies, the, the success that they've had, again, one of the issues that's got them in the front page of the news is, is how well they are doing from a profit perspective. I think the company has been able to manage a lot of the issues uh, that it has had. Um, again, I think if you look at the strategy that it's put in place, the leadership team that's there, and, and again, as much um, Galen Weston's got a lot of the focus, but uh, his uh, second in command at Loblaws, who was brought back out of retirement a couple of years ago to help kind of drive this change and this this growth, uh, is retiring too. So, um, you know, I, I think it's probably uh, too early to tell whether or not much is going to change. But clearly, uh, uh, you know, I think, again, Loblaws has got its business figured out pretty well and, and has been been very successful and, and and it is also interesting again a lot of news out of Loblaws recently you know announcing a commitment to invest and expand and grow to expand its uh, employee complement looking at adding 6,000 more jobs to its, its network um, you know again I think that a lot of those plans are well underway um, that's this two billion dollar investment that they announced recently uh, you know this is going to unfold um, as the, the new CEO come, comes to play. But I think it really is kind of reflects the strong growth strategy and, and strong success that Loblaws has had as a company. We, we were seeing a couple of news stories this week that uh, were framing the issue of inflation differently in this country, which I, I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, you know, general inflation is lower than it has been, but higher than certainly we've been used to in recent years still. Um, and food inflation remains stubbornly high, but these news stories were, you know, oh, you know, the the the, the rate of inflation is slowing, so you know things are are getting a whole lot better. What is what is your take on this gap between general inflation and food prices and food inflation specifically? You know, Chris, it's always important to remember that when people talk about inflation slowing that doesn't mean products are going to get cheaper right what they're talking about is that they're just going to get more expensive less slowly than they were before and so i always think that that's an important uh, distinction again we have this uh, target that our central bank aims for where we've got two to three percent inflation across effectively across the economy government recognizes things are going to get a little bit more expensive every year but not get so much more expensive that it puts undue undue pressure and so um, again, we're seeing it, you know, inflation starting to slow down and we're seeing uh, kind of the impact uh, of, a, of changes on a variety of different food products. But, um, you know, there, there is, there's some interesting kind of dynamics playing out. And in March, we saw, for example, um, food uh, starting to come down, other pieces uh, staying high, um, some prices actually getting, getting cheaper, uh, you know, gas. I think most people have seen this as, as less expensive, uh, 15%, almost less expensive than it was in March last year. So that's that's helping balance off kind of the, the full impact of inflation on, on homeowners, but food is still one of those uh, ones that's, that's sticking high. And so um, it's gonna take some time. Again, we've talked in the past about this, this whole kind of basket of issues that are keeping food more expensive. It's going to take some time for the, all of those issues to kind of work themselves out and for food inflation in general to get back to where, where it should, should be. Our colleague Isabel um, Bouchard wrote a, a, an interesting blog this week on, you know, are we getting used to it? Is it, is our trademark Canadian complacency taking over and we're just going to take the hit? Uh, on our on our pocketbooks, um, what's your sense of, of that? Are, are people getting 
are people just becoming accustomed to the higher prices that we've been seeing now for more than a year? And, you know, in your networks, are people talking about food pricing and their grocery bill as much as they were so at, at one point? Yeah, so, so I think when you look at the public opinion polling that we've seen, if you look at how, uh, what we know about how people are, are concerned, um, you know, I don't, don't think we've seen a, a noticeable change yet in those numbers. And, and, and I really do think it reflects the reality that, you know, food inflation hits us all differently. So um, higher income Canadians tend to generally be less concerned. They tend to feel the pinch less hard than others. Um, but, you know, the reality is, is that for a lot of Canadians that already struggle to make ends meet, this ongoing impact of high prices continues to have uh, uh, an impact. It continues to, to, to put extra strain on household budgets. Uh, uh, food banks in Toronto were out recently uh, talking about the, you know, the increase in, in visits that they're experiencing, that they're, that they're living with, talking about the challenges that that's, you know, it's almost exponential growth that they've seen, you know, the, the, the pandemic in, drove up uh, use of, of food banks and then all of these other economic pressures then has, has pushed that even further as food's gotten more expensive, which is compounded by the, you know, the reality for food banks with the fact that the food that they're buying is now getting more expensive. So they're having to buy more food when they're having to buy more expensive food. So, you know, I, I think some people are getting used to it, um, but a lot of people are still struggling with it. And, and clearly, you know, we need to not only see food inflation flow, but, you know, we need to get that right balance between ensuring that people have, you know, incomes that are good enough in order to, to, uh, to deal with, again, food and housing and transportation costs that, that have all seen pretty significant pressure over the last year. And global events keep coming at, uh, at us and affecting, you know, some staples and commodities, right? There, there was word out this week that um, there might be a rice shortage around the world, and that could affect up to 3.5 3 billion people. Um, what's your take on on where rice is at this year? And is it something that we need to be focused more on? You know, we've talked about wheat, we've talked about other staples and commodities, but it, you know, is rice the new the new wheat? You know, I, I think what we have is a new normal, Chris. Where you know, almost every year we can expect one part of the world that grows a lot of food to face some significant pressures on growing that that food. So this year we're looking at, at Pakistan, other parts of Asia that are major rice producers that are experiencing the impacts of extreme weather. Um, again, we've seen it in the past with, with wheat. Uh, last year there was uh, uh, heat waves in India and droughts in and, and China. And so we've got these issues this year on, on rice growing. And, and um, again, rice is a staple commodity for so many in this world that really is incredibly important. Um, you know, I think, We've got this immediate pressure on, on rice production this year. The good news is we still have quite a bit of stocks. Again, you know, people may not think of this, but we do, countries around the world, companies do keep effectively reserves of food to help weather the storm. The problem is, you know, how those reserves compared to the amount that we actually use um, is getting uh, smaller. So, so our stock to use ratio, we, we, we would talk about, um, is, is under pressure. And so our ability to, again, to weather a bad year is not the same as it used to be. Our rice stocks are, are okay. Um, it's complicated by the fact that a lot of those stocks are held in China. And so whereas, you know, stocks that are held um, in the Philippines, you know, may actually leave the Philippines if there's a shortage somewhere else, stocks that are held in China tend not to leave China. So um, it's hard that when you, you get a pressure in some countries, when you get these situations like we've seen in, in North Africa and the Middle East as a result of the Ukraine invasion, uh, the fact that we have stocks may not be all of that helpful because the stocks are somewhere where they can't actually be put to use. So I think what, what we expect to see on the rice situation is um, a tough year this year, hopefully a better year next year. Um, probably see some prices go up, but again, I think it reflects this new reality that we should be expecting to see pressure on production for major commodities um, every year. It's it's the new world we live in. 
and are these you know systems that you've described you know to absorb a bad year are they fit for purpose when there are more and more bad years you know that's a really interesting question and we could spend uh you know a day talking about this it's interesting you know, we talk about international trade rules and and kind of how effective they are but there's this dynamic that's changed to where um, trade barriers used to be put in place in order to keep food out of a country, and increasingly they're being used to keep food into a country. So again, we talk about China, you, countries are holding stocks, but they're not putting those stocks out into the market to relieve pressure when they're needed. And so uh, that question around fit for purpose and whether or not we have the right relief valves is a really important one. I think it puts extra emphasis on countries like Canada that can, uh, when we can, to produce more and to export more, to, to be that relief valve to the world. Uh, because, uh, you know, the old way of doing things, of, of stockpiling food and, and being able to access it when you need it, doesn't work as well as it used to. We had a story from a, a British chef, James Martin, taking on big margarine this week saying margarine is the worst thing you can have in your fridge and use in your cooking, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to get into, you know, margarine versus butter and that age old debate, but you reminded me of some really interesting um, historical tortured Canadian history on margarine. Can you, can you just re remind us of, of where we've been in this country in the debate on margarine? Yeah, margarine versus butter is not just a controversial issue for British chefs. It's a controversial issue for uh, provinces, for companies, for dairy farmers. So if you go back, uh, you know, uh, almost 100 years ago or over 100 years ago, I guess, um, there's been a ban in place. There was a ban in place for margarine uh, in Canada at the turn of the century, again, largely to support uh, the, the dairy industry, but, it, you know, I think the, the view, the perception at the time was that butter wasn't a healthy product. And so um, Canada effectively had a ban on, on margarine up until the 50s. Um, worth noting that the ban was lifted at the end of the Second World War in order to be able to put, uh, you know, use margarine to address food stock issues. The problem was Newfoundland, uh, for all of this time, was outside of Canada. And Newfoundland had a margarine business and margarine industry, a couple of companies that were manufacturing it. And so when Newfoundland joined Canada in uh, 1950 or 1949, uh, they actually had to agree, negotiate a special terms so that the Newfoundland's margarine company could exist because there was still a prohibition in the, in the books. It's worth noting that so there was some court actions that were taken in place. Effectively, it was decided that provinces themselves would then be responsible for setting margarine policy for keeping the bans in place. Usually what those bans looked like was uh, preventing companies, you know, they allowed companies to sell margarine, but they couldn't make it look like butter. So for a while, when you bought margarine, you would get a pack of food coloring that you could mix in with it in order to be able to make it look more like butter. The, you know, the food company couldn't do that, but you as the consumer could. Um, and again, this, is, this isn't ancient history. Uh, you know, it was uh, 1995 when that law came off the books in Ontario, and, and it was, uh, it was uh, 2000 and, uh, 2008, whenever the law came off the books in Quebec. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, the, the, the margarine laws, the margarine prohibition um, started 100 years ago and, and really only went away 15. I, I did not know that margarine played such a, a role in Canadian Confederation, and uh, thank you for that. that slice of Canadiana with some margarine on top. Appreciate it very much. We'll talk soon. Thanks, Chris.